eminent members of the panel, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you a very good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to interact with all of you from thousands of miles away. The city where I stay and work in is called as Lucknow. It is around 500 miles southeast of New Delhi, the capital of India. The beautiful building that you see in front of you is the medical university I work in, King George's Medical University, and I am working there as a professor in the Department of Cardiology. We all know that non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases, are today the number one global killers. And when this epidemic of cardiovascular diseases and non-communicable diseases is also adversely affected by another epidemic of communicable diseases, for example, the HIV epidemic, uh, then probably the combination of two causes much, much more havoc on humanity than both of them individually. Well, today I would restrict my conversations in non-communicable diseases to cardiovascular diseases, which is my area of speciality. And I would like to give you all a brief overview of the clinical interaction between HIV and cardiovascular systems and how they both uh, synergistically add more, uh, more sufferings to our patients in modern times. So HIV has the potential to adversely affect cardiovascular diseases in all spectrum of cardiovascular diseases, the most common of which is coronary artery disease, myocardial infarctions, acute coronary syndrome, which are clearly the number one global killers as of now. HIV also in, uh, involves the myocardium and the pericardium, that is the muscle and the covering of the heart, causing myocardial dysfunctions, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, as well as pericarditis and pericardial effusions. It is also responsible for some cases of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, HIV has got a strange interaction with the electrical system of the heart also, and atrial fibrillation tends to happen more frequently with HIV infection, and the management also is, uh, is a little controversial here. And then both HIV and cardiovascular system, uh, cardiovascular diseases, sorry, um, have got their own individual treatments. But when we treat uh, each other uh, in, in combination, then probably we have to remember a certain kind of interactions of both these medications and how we should use them judiciously when both of them are present in one patient. Well, the spectrum of coronary artery disease in a HIV patient, if you take an example of North America, around 15% of deaths in a HIV population happen because of cardiovascular diseases, mainly coronary artery disease. Uh, the most common clinical presentation of coronary artery disease in a HIV patient is acute coronary syndrome. And the salient features here are that the mean age tend to be younger than those uh, as far as the acute coronary syndrome occurs is concerned as compared to those patients who do not have HIV infection. In these particular patients, HIV has been there for a pretty prolonged period of time, more than 8 to 10 years. Most of these patients are, ant are on antiretroviral therapies. Most of them are smokers and have some degree of dyslipidemia. Uh, sometimes we have seen that when patients are suffering from a communicable disease, then there tends to be more uh, tendency for the physicians to put them just on medical therapy and not offer them the surgical or the newer medical therapy advancements as far as invasive therapy is concerned. And here I would like to stress that the outcomes of both coronary angioplasty or it is known as the percutaneous coronary interventions, as well as the coronary artery bypass surgery, the efficacy of both of them is similar in the HIV population as compared to non-HIV population. So there should not be any, any bias as compared to treatment of HIV patients just on medical therapy. If we think that PCI and CABG are to be offered to the patient, we must offer them to the patient and they, uh, they end up have been equally beneficial in HIV population as compared to a non-HIV population. 
the ACS incidence is substantially high with HIV. Um, recurrence uh, is substantially higher with HIV infection as compared to those patients who do not have HIV. Well, if you take a look at why HIV is adversely affecting coronary artery disease, if you just go into basics of pathophysiology, and I would just like to give you a very broad overview, HIV can influence the traditional coronary artery disease risk factors. For example, a smoker HIV has got 2.5 times more risk uh, of causing um, uh, uh, adverse outcomes in coronary artery disease as compared to um, uh, smoking in a non-HIV patients. Hypertension tends to be more in patients on antiretroviral therapy and dyslipidemia therapy um, is also, most of the statins are also to some degree are uh, having interaction with protease inhibitors with the exceptions of one or two statins about which we will tell you later. The, so the treatment of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and uh, is difficult in patients of HIV and smoking causes more harm in HIV population as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned as compared to a non-HIV patient. HIV per se is an inflammatory state and a procoagulant state. Both inflammation and, pro and, and coagulant state tends to, tends to cause more plaque rupture and cause more acute coronary syndromes and myocardial infarctions. Immune activation is also one of the pathophysiology. Vascular endothelial dysfunction is also one of the features of HIV infections. And all these uh, in combination are a lethal for patients who already have some atherosclerosis. All these make the patients of atherosclerosis more, more prone to plaque rupture and more prone to acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction. It's also seen that when patients of coronary artery disease who are on antiretroviral therapy, if that antiretroviral therapy is disrupted or interrupted because of any reason whatsoever, the patient has an increased risk of having acute coronary syndrome. And that is also one thing that needs to be emphasized here. We also know that muscles of the heart, that is the myocardium, is affected by HIV virus and it has got multiple etiology. It is affected directly by HIV virus as well as other cardiotropic viruses are more likely to cause something called as the inflammation or the infection of heart muscles called as the myocarditis and symptomatic myocarditis or cardiomyopathy is known to occur in patients of HIV disease. Of course, illicit drug users, cardiac tumors and autonomic dysfunctions are also uh, agents which cause myocardial systolic dysfunctions in patients of HIV. Pericardial diseases, uh, pericardial effusion, pericarditis, uh, because of HIV infection as well as other opportunistic infections that, up, that happen in HIV uh, can cause both pericardial effusion and pericarditis and this is something also that we must know. Atrial fibrillation and flutter happen more frequently in patients of HIV and the role of anticoagulation, which is very important in, um, in, uh, in patients of atrial fibrillation, is really uncertain in patients of um, uh, HIV. There's no consensus whether it should be given or not, but there are many multivariate predictors of AF in HIV, that is lower CD4 count, higher viral load, older age, uh, prior presence of coronary artery disease and congestive heart failures and renal failures, hypothyroidism and alcoholism, etc. Whenever we treat coronary artery disease or cardiovascular diseases, we tend to calculate uh, the risk factor for development of coronary artery disease. And it is seen that the HIV uh, causes, um, HIV causes around 1.4 to 1 or 2 times more, uh, it adds, it, it, uh, it multiplies the risk of coronary artery disease uh, in, in population by 1.4 to 2 times uh, the normal. And if you take the average baseline risk of uh, coronary artery disease in the population that is infected with HIV and we multiply it by the additional HIV risk that imposes, we tend to have an overall risk of developing 
coronary artery disease in patients of HIV to around 23 to 35% over next 10 years, and that is equivalent to um, having uh, uh, that is equivalent to actually diabetes. So HIV status, HIV positive status, should be treated as a cardiovascular risk equivalent, and should be all the risk factors in this particular um, scenario in patients. If the patient has hypertension, if the patient has dyslipidemia, it should be treated. If the patient has diabetes, additional diabetes, it they should be treated much much more rigorously in these patients if we want to uh, prevent an adverse cardiovascular. The statin use, a word is required here um, because most of the statins uh, interact with the, the antiretrovirus therapy by having a common pathway of cytochrome P450 system. Um, the two examples, the two exceptions here are Pitava statin and Rosua statin. So these statins appear to be safer in patients uh, who are suffering from HIV and should be the statins of choice whenever statins are to be given in such so i would briefly like to summarize my presentation and my overview uh, is that hiv positive status is actually a coronary artery disease risk equivalent co-morbidities enhance the risk in many patients with hiv um, much much more um, as compared to patients who do not have hiv modifiable risk factors modification is an important role um, in any patient with cardiovascular disease, more so in the patients of HIV, standard approaches to coronary artery disease risk reductions should be uh, offered to patients of HIV, especially uh, uh, the PCI and CABG. They should, we should not hold such therapies in patients who have HIV. And atrial fibrillation is also emerging as one of the uh, prominent threats in aging and younger populations of HIV. I um, thank you for your kind attention, and I hope the symposium uh, adds more value in our in our in our knowledge about treating this um, this intersection between non-communicable disease and a communicable disease um, epidemic, both in their own cells. So um, I thank you for your attention, and hope you have a good day ahead. Thank you.